Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Pravinda Johar, who is Chief Executive Officer at Bloom Global. And today we're going to talk about Beyond Control Tower, how cognitive command centers are revolutionizing supply chains. So like its sibling supply chain visibility, supply chain control towers continue to garner a lot of attention and discussion in the industry. But as new technologies and capabilities are introduced, such as AI and machine learning, are we evolving toward a new type of solution, what some are calling cognitive command centers? And what is a cognitive command center? What new or additional uh, benefits does it provide? And what's required to successfully implement uh, you know, such a command center and realize business benefits? So those are some of the key questions we're going to discuss in today's episode. It's great to have Pravinder on the program to share his insights uh, on this topic. So Pravinder, welcome to the program. Thank you, Adrian, for uh, having me on the program again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we always have some nice conversations and certainly a lot has happened since the last time we talked, including, you know, Bloom getting acquired by Wise Tech Global. And, and I, I certainly want to touch upon that, but uh, I'll, I'll wait till the end of the discussion. I, I want to dive into, you know, the, the topic of today's episode first. And so, so, you know, like I said, you know, supply chain control towers, you know, have been around for many years. And, and I think if you ask, you know, 10 people, what is a supply chain control tower? You'll probably get 11, 11 different answers. Um, so why have companies been implementing, you know, control towers and what limitations still exist with, you know, some of these, you know, more traditional solutions? I think if I look back, right, so, so, you know, we've been doing logistics and supply chain seems like going on three, four decades. So, so it's a long, long time to... And the evolution of control towers started off with what we used to do on data center and networking side. So if you remember the uh, on the networking side, uh, as you know, I used to work for Hewlett Packard. So if you think of what, what it really means to manage a large network, typically you have NOCs or network operating centers and kind of a, there's an evolution around that. How do you look at across your entire network that what's really going on, what the exceptions are and how do we go, go manage them? And supply chain being a network, the same concept kind of came, came about that we need a control tower because if you're running a large supply chain, uh, how do you know what's the health of your supply chain? There are too many touch points, too many kind of connected uh, parties where things can go wrong. Uh, so, so many people, when they implemented control tower, it used to be just kind of visibility and used to be reporting, exception management, and people took it to be more of that kind of, it's a, it's a nice room to go. And I remember kind of many of my chief supply chain officers, even 10, 15 years back, kind of you, you walk in, it will be that, no, no, we have control towers and there's a big room with big TV screens and I can see exactly what's going on. And then it used to be kind of more of that, you're, you're just watching it and looking for kind of what had, uh, what had gone, uh, gone wrong. Now, uh, the, on technology side, we have had kind of so many people talk about control towers. And then and there are kind of in the market today, there are planning control towers and there are execution control towers. And then it became control towers are only really for international logistics and for the domestic guys kind of never called it a control tower because for them it was just a TMS trying to manage my LTL and truckload networks to last my, my logistics. So the reason you get those 11 answers today, uh, that there's a ton of confusion around it, but what's even the purpose of a control tower? And then, then you can have kind of some fancy screens and some reports and you can call it a control tower or, or we'll talk more about an evolution of what was the real purpose of it and how has it uh, how has it really evolved uh, but but traditionally kind of that's where where they have come come from yeah you know i remember those uh, you know early days and i remember that you know i would see it in the publications uh you know they would always have these nice photographs this is even before you know the internet if you will but yeah. you know mm -hmm. you have website but it would be in the, in the industry trade publications there would be some kind of article like Hewlett packard has a control tower whatever the case might be and you would see these photographs of you're right. These big conference rooms are just, you know, TVs all over the place. Yeah. And, you know, it looked cool at the time. And, and some of those, the graphics were rudimentary that you would see, you know, early on. And then like the next evolution was, hey, you know, they actually got the screens actually got, you know, the graphics actually got more, you know, uh, uh, you know, impressive or, were, were, you know, greatly improved. 
Um, but I think you're right. I mean, I think, you know, kind of the the boundaries between visibility solutions and control towers kind of got, uh, you know, the, that line got blurred. Um, you have so many, you have so many different flavors of, of what is a, a control tower and, and how does it differentiate from a visibility solution? And then there's always the question of, you know, well, okay, it's one thing to actually see what's happening, but then what, what do you actually do with it? How do you actually derive, you know, business value from it? And I think that's where we're kind of moving toward now. And it, and it seems like we, we've we evolved toward, you know, I know what you're calling, you know, cognitive command center. Um, so I guess that the first question is, you know, what is a cognitive command center? Yeah. I think uh, if you look at running a large complex supply chain or even a smaller supply chain, right, kind of the, there are many, many functions within the supply chain that you have to worry about, right? So anything from procurement, uh, order management, uh, logistics, uh, the impact on your customers, kind of what's going on on your warehousage. So it's the first part kind of, of, uh, of the command center has been this uh, notion of a digital twin of your supply chain to even know kind of how can I simulate it. But that's not enough, right? So, so because typically when you think of a command center and then uh, the higher up you go in an organization, kind of your, uh, your job becomes more and more of dealing with exceptions, right? Even for me as a CEO, I think my normal job is just dealing with things that are not going well, not necessarily kind of things that are going well. So first notion is that are we good at detecting exceptions and what do those exceptions even mean, mean to us? Second part of it is that kind of in, in supply chain, these exceptions happen repetitively. And so, so, there, so I talk about kind of a simplest example, right? So there are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns, right? So known unknowns are shipments will run late once in a while. Your factory will have an issue once in a while. There will be kind of like uh, today, I mean, um, uh, as you know, I live in California. Uh, and then Cupertino and Sunnyvale today kind of looks like power is out and power is out for a long time. It's been out from last night and it's going to be out till kind of tomorrow uh, as per some reports because of the high wind. Now, again, those are the type of things will just happen. And, and when we start talking about cognitive, cognitive is that as these things happen over and over again, are we getting smarter about it? Or as a minimum, are we handling them the same way or in a better way on an ongoing basis. And both are critical, Adrian, right? So there is the same way is that kind of, when you think of an exception, have we figured out how, what will I do in that particular case, case or not, right? So, so, so think of simulation abilities, being able to kind of model that these exceptions will happen and when they do happen, kind of what would you do? And we do it very well on the technology side. Right? We have disaster recovery, business continuity plans. We will go and run a test to say that kind of if my primary data center goes down, how do I make sure that my secondary data center is up? Are they disconnected? Are they separate? So, so concepts are not new you know, between kind of what we do on our daily life on the cloud cloud software side or running running a data center and what you have to go do on the on, on the supply chain side. But this simulation ability has always been missing, right? Because you have to be able to plan and predict what type of exceptions will happen and how would I handle them. But then you need a memory to say that this is what I decided I was going to go to. And so, so think of our cognitive command center. You do need what exception, what process will we follow? Who will kind of do what, right? Because if you don't know that, kind of you can be sitting in a command center just trying to figure out on the fly that what am I going to go do? And the second part is this whole learning ability to say that once we have handled something, right, you, you always have to go back and say what we could have done better. And so, so you're trying to kind of again learn from that this is how, right? so, so I think we've talked about it before and then in talking about the flirts, the Thailand flirt and kind of Japan flirt, the, the Japan kind of the nuclear power incidents, they, they're still fresh in my memory. But if someone would have started working in supply chain three or four years back or five years back, they won't even know what I am talking about, right? So you have to be kind of that you were living in kind of your early 2010s in the supply chain world to know that those things have happened. Now, they happen once in a while. What is my long-term memory as an organization? And I think when you start getting into that cognitive part, it's my long-term memory that this is how we're going to handle 
uh, things that that happen in 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 future of course they need to be modified for the current circumstances but again when you think of all those things one is that it's about not only about knowing the exceptions it's about how do i go deal with an exception am i being consistent do i have an organizational memory right and then then kind of we can talk more about that how do you do automation right? because you can't do it with with a large number of large number of people which are all kind of features of a cognitive command center well yeah you know you you raise a lot of points there and and you know we could probably spend you know an hour unpacking each, each of those things but I, I think you know some of the things i heard was you know certainly the digital twin component of it which i think is very interesting is very important you know the, the ability to you know digitally represent you know your your end to end supply chain um, and I think that's an area that a lot of companies still continue to fall short on. So I think that's that's kind of a foundational step here. But to your point, you know, that's just not enough. Um, you know, I also heard simulation, you know, the ability to then simulate different scenarios. Um, and I think the the cognitive piece is very interesting because, you know, you're right. For those of us that have been in the industry and, and, and many others out there that, you know, been around 20, 30, 40 years, um, you know, there are there are a lot of things that we've encountered that and there's a lot of learning lessons learned um i think the problem has been historically that a lot of those lessons learned have you know remained here right there's a lot of institutional knowledge uh that a lot of people have and then unfortunately they leave the company or they retire or whatever the case might be and historically that hasn't been captured in any kind of of way so that from a systems standpoint the next time such an exception happens or such an event happens um, we can, you know, uh, automate or execute on, you know, what worked the last time or, or what was the, you know, what would be an appropriate corrective action or response or, you know, particular situation. So, so I think that's an interesting aspect of this as well, that, that whole cognitive area. So, so I think you already touched upon what was going to be my next question, which is, you know, uh, uh, you know, how does, how does that cognitive con command center differ from a control tower? But maybe let's talk about, you know, what new or additional benefits and, when you embed all these capabilities you talked about, you know what new or different uh, benefits does it provide? So I think the, the 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 second, if I touch on kind of the cognitive and what it means today to run in the cloud, where multiple companies uh, kind of in the ecosystem, different industries are dealing with same type of an exception, and I've been calling it that that cognitive component is really collective intelligence. Right. For, for someone like us, right, when, when we, you're running kind of many, many command centers for many different companies, you see a pattern, right? And then the pattern is kind of where so, so we, you and I talked about that, how for one company we may have handled it, but now start imagining that now you have a cognitive command center across kind of many companies and you're trying to do playbook across them. And then, then each company is learning from each other, right? So, and traditionally, kind of, if you think on cognitive side of multi-company, uh, kind of, when I was with the high-tech company, we had kind of sessions with the CPG company to share how do they run their supply chain, how do we run it, or, or an automotive company. And then it was back to that kind of those again for sessions, and I remember doing them. Sometimes they were two days long, and you're flying to Midwest, kind of from from California, sitting down. But now the cognitive engine behind it is actually observing it across many, many companies and coming up with these playbooks, which can be modified and kind of uh, programmed for each one. And I don't mean literally programmed, but programmed in, in, in a sense that now, you know, these common playbooks that how do I go apply it? Second part of it that, that we have been focused on, but that's a kind of key component of cognitive that are we talking about a single company intelligence or are we talking about an industry platform which is learning from multiple companies? Right. So, so I think all, all of us know that there won't only be one platform. So I'm not talking about we still will have an issue of these platforms learning from each other too. But on a platform where there are multiple command centers for multiple different companies, you get a different advantage than kind of doing something which may be hosted or, or the traditional command centers, which are very kind of siloed for each company. Uh, in the in the ecosystem, the second part has been on the on this uh, automation side. And so as you start learning, and then we have talked about it, I think before that move from the decision support system to decision making system. Decision making is a cognitive act. 
right? So it's kind of, if I think of it, this isn't support, is that I will give you all the information. So if you think of people who call control tower is reporting and kind of analytics and dashboard, right? They're only doing decision support at best. On decision making, now you need to let the machine kind of uh, uh, make those decisions when these exceptions happen and not wait for it. Uh, we, I think we have a very recent example, not in supply chain, but uh, as you think of what happened with the Silicon Valley Bank mm -hmm. and the speed mattered. Now that, that speed caused all type of issues, right? So if you think of those five hours when $46 billion got kind of withdrawn from, from Silicon Valley Bank, it was that kind of whoever was first, second, the first 30, 40 billion got withdrawn. There was no issue, right? The issue came in later. And in supply chain, we see it all the time, right? So, so if, you're, if you're faster in kind of procuring capacity from a supplier when there's a disruption, uh, procuring capacity from a logistics provider when there's a disruption, right? and there are winners and losers, right? So, so, the, so the faster you are in making that decision, uh, the easier it is for you to manage a disruption. And again, when you get to cognitive ability to be able to make those decisions kind of at that at, at machine speed versus human speed uh, to, to some extent, that again is a big advantage for these cognitive con uh, command centers. You know, I, I love the, the, the first point you raised, um, which I'm, I'm a big proponent of because I think, you know, I'm a big proponent um, and evangelist, if you will, for, network-based platforms and network effects, right? So really what you were talking about here is, is one of the benefits of, of being as part of a, a connected network of trading partners on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a platform is this ability for network-based business intelligence and analytics. And what you, you know, so you've extended that or what you're, what you're talking about is really an extension of that, which is, you know, network-based cognitive learning. Uh, yeah. So it's not about just learning about what's happening within your um uh, control tower, if you will, but you know the system, the platform is able to learn across these different, you know, supply chains and these different networks, and come up with these, you know, network-based um, um, playbooks, as you call them, uh, or recommendations, uh, learning, so forth, that can be shared with everyone that's part of that, um, you know, part of that network. So, so, I, so I, I love that. And then the second point, I think, is something that we've also been talking a lot about and, and researching on is, you know. And it's the same conversation with visibility, right? It's like, how do you actually derive vis business value from from all these things? And it really comes from, you know, the execution, you know, side of things to be able to actually take what you're seeing, what you're learning and so forth, but then being able to have that trigger, you know, some 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 actions. And I love, you know, the SVP and uh, you know, uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, analogy there, because yes, you're right. I mean, uh, speed is of the essence. And sometimes if you're first to secure that capacity, first to, you know, whether it's transportation capacity or supplier materials capacity, whatever the case might be, because you've got that intelligence, you're able to automate, you know, some, some of these actions, um, you know, you effectively are able to minimize the impact or avoid the impact altogether that others that um, have, you know, take a much longer time to analyze the situation, or understand what's happening, and then act by that point, it might be, um, you know, it might be too late. So obviously, you know, from a technology standpoint, you know, one of the things that is making this possible, I would assume, is another buzz term in the industry, but obviously, you know, machine learning and things like that. So I'm, I, I assume that things like machine learning um, is, you know, a critical capability in making this possible today, right? Absolutely. And I think if you think of it, you know, uh, I mean, we can talk on another session about chat GPT and its impact on supply chain or, or, or the similar technologies on that side. But machine learning, uh, and I think uh, if, if you remember Professor Powell from Princeton, right, so he talks about that in supply chain, we have these sequential decision problems, right? And uh, and I was reading his most recent book, and he's talking about kind of how his journey from 1982 to now, where we have moved on from kind of what, what used to be um, uh, more optimization techniques to now reinforcement learning and which is a form of machine learning and then and, and, uh, and an award system and all of that is now possible not only because of the techniques are available on machine learning and artificial intelligence side but the compute power is such that we can actually deploy those techniques see some of these techniques Adrian, are old right but you could not deploy them even machine learning and others because you just didn't have enough compute power and now with the compute power it has made it all kind of feasible to do them in real time uh, versus before kind of you will you will be sitting in a lab 
trying to do a simulation for days and weeks. And now these things can happen in matters of seconds and minutes uh, using kind of these newer, both the newer techniques and the compute power, which is available to us. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that that has been the, you know, a, a game changer for sure. The whole thing with cloud computing and everything else. Because I, I, I remember that. I mean, I remember talking even, forget about everything we were talking about today. Sometimes even just basic, some basic transportation optimization problems, you know, that you would try to do, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, if you try to do some kind of multi-mode optimization, whatever the case might be, you know, it would it would take hours, if not days, which was just not operational, you know. Uh, and today, those same types of problems can be done in, you know, literally seconds, um, which which is, uh, you know, amazing. Um, so I, I, I guess um, as a way to wrap up, I mean, based on your experience, you know, with clients, I mean, what's ultimately required to successfully implement the, a, a, you know, cognitive command center and, and realize business benefits? I think the very first step is just defining the problem well, right? Because I think if you start looking for the technology, kind of there's a lot of technology. If you have not really defined what the outcome is that you're trying to achieve, kind of on, on that side, uh, is a prerequisite for for any business to kind of start looking at cognitive command uh, command centers. Is that you truly need to have kind of that uh, that vision, and you have to define those those components. And then I think the second is not jumping to the end state too quickly. So it's a journey. I think as we work with many companies, it's a journey that initially you're just trying to say that, can I centralize it? Can I look at what the functions are? Who does what? And then start automating it. Right, because if uh, because if you jump into it too quickly in there, you might leave something behind. And then then something behind is again in the topic we were talking about before. So many things are in people's minds and heads on how the company supply chain really runs. A machine is not going to be learn it, uh, be able to learn it unless it can monitor it. Right? So, so these cognitive command center is almost that like you put them in place uh, and then you start moving your business or supply chain over to cognitive uh, uh, command centers. Let the system learn, let, let things happen. And as things happen and you're learning more and more, right? start automating them and start changing uh, what, what people's jobs look like, uh, start changing kind of what it really means to be running running the uh, uh, running match supply chain uh, too. Uh, but but I think I will say those two things, one, defining the problem well is probably 90% of the issue, right? because otherwise you will end up with a technology where who knows what problem it is solving, right? So you have to start off with the problem that you're trying to solve. And second, not jumping in because, because you don't want to leave something behind. Because as chief supply chain officers, kind of, when I was in uh, my practitioner role, our role is to continue to run the supply chain effectively on an ongoing basis without disruption. And you don't want to cause a disruption by trying to do something too quickly, kind of on, on this side. Yeah, no, some some great advice there, which which I agree with, and I think it's interesting. You know, the point you brought up, and, and this could be a topic for another conversation for sure, is that. You know, as as these cognitive command centers, you know, take hold, and you know, you've got machines learning and and automating, you know, transactions. You know, the whole question of well, what will supply chain and logistics professionals be doing five years from now, ten years from now, or maybe it's not even that long down the road, right? How how will the roles and responsibilities of you know supply chain professionals? Um, need to evolve and change, you know, over the years as these technologies, you know, take hold. So I think that's an that's an interesting, you know, question that 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 comes up. That uh, I think I'm going to hold off. You know, that might be a good topic for for a future episode. But be, before we close out here, uh, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, um, um, I I have to ask, of course, because uh, you know, big big announcement uh, not, not too long ago about Bloom Global getting acquired by Wise Tech Global. Uh, so number one, congratulations uh, on the uh, on the transaction there. So, um, I mean, what does this ultimately mean for for Bloom and and your customers and and you know what what's the road ahead look like? I think if you look at the two companies, Biotech and us, right? So, so so the first thing which was important to kind of I think both sides, right? That is that these two are really product driven companies. And there's a lot of kind of R and D. I mean, I think we've talked about it before. Seventy percent of our staff is in R and D, kind of in there. We are product led, engineering driven kind of company versus a versus a, many cases you find sales and marketing driven companies. But culturally, it was a very very good fit. 
right? I think we have talked about the amount of money we have spent on R and D over the last four five years. I think if if you listen to kind of the public uh, earnings for the uh, for White Stack, they have also spent kind of over seven hundred fifty million uh, Australian dollars in R and D in the last few years. And there's a lot more investment that they and us will continue to go go make. Uh, they are the largest kind of, if you think from, from the market cap perspective, it's one of the largest, if not the largest kind of uh, supply chain software company. Not as well known in US because it's an Australian headquartered company, uh, but the depth of systems, like the number of trade forwarders who use them uh, and the global customs platform, kind of these were all complementary things between what we do and what, um, what White Tech does. And together for, for our employees, it's a lot of new opportunities, kind of, but for the industry and for our customer base and their customer base, there's a lot of new capabilities that we can enable by kind of combining these two, two platforms. So I'm excited about it. We're looking forward to it, but, but it was a, a not kind of a, um, not a decision that got done kind of uh, very lightly. It was the right cultural fit, right set of the product driven, engineering driven, uh, even companies uh, kind of uh, uh, we are software product people so so we will continue to look at that how do we how do we continue to invest and bring kind of the capabilities from the two sides together i mean if you think of just the global customs part so many of our shippers or our, our businesses don't really have a global customs uh, platform on it and there are not that many in the in the in the market and White Stack has, has one, which is probably the best in class kind of global trade and compliance system, uh, which is there, which was not our focus. Now we can bring those things together to, 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 to some of our customers. And that's only one of the examples, Adrian. There's so many more yeah. that, that we can do. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I always say there's never a dull moment in this industry. You know, I, 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 I have to... Being an industry analyst now for you know over 23 years, nothing surprises me anymore. And uh, you know, so I, when I saw the press release, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I always think the, these types of transactions, um, uh, you, you know, each one obviously is very different. Um, but I think as you described, each one also provides a lot of great opportunity, not only for the employees and and the teams of the respective companies, but ultimately for for customers as well. You know, it all boils down to what we talked about in a different context in this episode. It all comes down to execution, right? Um, so ultimately, um, I, and you said something that I think is very important that's ultimately important to any the success of any merger and acquisition is the alignment of culture. And it sounds like that was one of the things you highlighted in terms of the, you know, uh, that alignment there between Wise Tech Global and, and, the, and the culture there at Bloom Global. So I think that's a that's a good, um, you know, starting point for sure. Well, Pravinder, um, you know, I think we could easily spend hours talking about uh, all of these topics. Certainly the topic of cognitive command centers um, is going to continue to evolve. And, and I think we'll, we'll you know, uh, hopefully we don't wait another a year before we talk again. But I'm sure that if we talk a year from now, um, we'll see a lot more advancements and learnings uh, in this area. So, again, thank you for making the time to be with us today. No, thank you for having me on the show. Great. I want to thank those of you that joined us. If you're watching this episode on demand, either at the Bloom Global website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question or a comment for Preventer, you can post it there. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. Again, thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.